Why hello there, welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host Agostino Zynga and this is episode number 530, that's 530 of the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host Agostino Zynga, I hope you are well wherever this podcast is finding you, if you're watching or listening in the background via YouTube, make sure you like obviously at the end or whenever you like the show make sure you subscribe if i've earned your subscription and of course leave a comment down below i'd love to hear your thoughts feelings and suggestions if you're listening via the numerous podcasting apps out there specifically the apple podcast app where you can leave reviews and you can leave star ratings please leave me a five four three two one star review i don't care which one it is just let people know that you're listening to it that you're engaged you know if it's bad if it's good whatever pop it on down there i'm greatly appreciative of any comments of any reviews i get on there at the moment I think I've got about 13 or 14 last time I checked if I can get those bumps up a few more I would greatly appreciate it and again of course support via Patreon is also more than welcome at patreon.com for just A-G-O-S-T-I-N-H-O I've missed a couple of weeks I'm going to have a bonus bit of content going up there I'm going to have a little bit of behind the scenes stuff going on the behind the scenes stuff but stuff you're not meant to see at certain like clubs I'm going to be absolutely uploading it onto the Patreon so if you want to see that kind of content make sure you tune into there and obviously the bonus episode of the show is going out this week too I booked in a session at Pirate Studios I'm going to do that on there as well so if you want to hear a more cleaner sort of um crisper version of the show done in a specific studio that i'm obviously going to pay for because people are paying for the podcast itself on patreon so why not go that extra step to make that experience and make that whole thing great then definitely tune in to the Patreon show at patreon.com for just Agostino. Get a bonus episode. You're meant to get one per week as well as a bonus episode at the end of the month, which I'm obviously going to be recording. So make sure you tune in over there. I've already got, I think, 13 subscribers on there too. So if I can get a few more, I'm trying to aim for 20. It's a bit of a stretch goal, seeing as I kind of only got to 12 the only last couple of days. Uh, so I've only got over 10, I think, in the last couple of months. So if I can get to 20, that'd be amazing. It's only a quid, equivalent of one pound. There's other tiers too, but the entry kind of tier is one pound it's about 100 of them i think there's about what 90 something of those left so if you want to join in definitely support the kid over there on patreon at patreon.com for just agostino you can find a link to that in the description below as well wherever you're listening or watching to this but anyway enough of the plugs enough of the plugs enough of the begging and all that nonsense that dsp does let's just jump right back in to the show well we are in some interesting times in it very very interesting times it looks like the Elmarian variant is kicking our collective asses apart from if you're in parts of north america or just the entire north america for the most part they don't really seem to be caring about covid as much as we do i guess in north america you only care about covid if you live in a state where they're actually taking it seriously um if you don't and even if you do and you're able to move around and you have some money you can expect you can basically go to a state where covid doesn't exist and just kind of enjoy yourself i'm looking at places like florida do you know what i mean they just kind of going on and continuing on as per normal so i kind of rate that i'm not going to lie i kind of kind of rate that so um you know us in europe we're getting our ass kicked we're getting our ass kicked when it comes to a marion variant or also known as omicron certain locations certain places are banning british you know tourists from going certain places are closing their doors to all tourism certain places are closing nightclubs all this sort of stuff closing shop like mad stuff's happening and it feels like a bit deja vu in it but the only thing I think that's come, one of the only benefits to come from all this nonsense that's been going on with COVID in general, I feel like as a as a global population, or maybe if we just focus in on Europeans for the most part, especially Western Europeans, right? I feel like we've become a lot more tougher. We've become a lot more mentally resilient. We look at people in Central Europe, people in Eastern Europe, people in maybe parts of far-flung Eastern Asia, or sorry, Far East Asia, and we kind of admire the way that they're sort of stoic and steadfast and kind of unwavering when it comes to the way that they kind of deal with the challenges that get thrown at them when it comes to life, right? Life kind of throws random challenges at you all the time. And and I've always said something I've always maintained is a bit macabre. It might be a little bit bleak and a little bit cynical, but I don't think it is. But I've always maintained the idea that life is mostly suffering. That's my basically, you know, um, thesis on it. Life is mostly suffering. And really what life is, is your kind of, and a good life is basically your ability to withstand that suffering and to kind of be able to enjoy the s small sparkles, 
the small flashes of goodness or happiness or joy that you will kind of feel throughout the entirety of your life because if you were to kind of jot things down and write them down in terms of your full year you'd probably have a lot more I wouldn't say negatives but a lot more kind of hard moments that you had to kind of overcome then really jump out of your seat run down the street naked happy 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 times they don't really exist that way people like to tell you that's the thing and especially things like you know Disney they'll sell you this illusion that life is meant to be some sort of fairy tale and everything ends happily ever after it doesn't really we all know people in our lives friends <clears throat> sorry colleagues and stuff who have kind of just been down in their luck through really no fault of their own they try their best they put their best foot forward but for whatever reason they always end up with the wrong person they end up at a terrible job they end up working for the terrible boss they end up um which crappy friends like there's just life just happens to them in ways that just doesn't make any sense they get robbed a few times they're in you know many many things happen to people that they just don't kind of bring upon themselves it's just kind of life throwing you you know um moldy fruit after moldy fruit and i think again like i said the only way to kind of combat that and the only way to kind of make life somewhat meaningful or make it matter or make it worth kind of getting up in the morning for is to be able to withstand it and be able to kind of condition yourself in a way that you can kind of withstand all that stuff and it's hard especially in this modern day that we live in this modern age we live in with all these kind of you know luxuries that we have technology and just the comfortability in life in general it's difficult to kind of build up any sort of resilience and I've kind of read a lot of books about it. There's this is one particular book by a female author. I forgot the name, her, her, her exact name, but the book name is called Grit. And I read, read that a couple of years ago because I was fascinated by the whole subject. I think it was maybe when I went on my whole Jocko Wilnick tilt and I was like, okay, as great as all these Army Navy SEALs are, this isn't something that is obviously, all, this isn't something that's kind of special to these guys. I think some people are born, I think when I came away from, listening to loads of his podcasts and stuff i was like oh, cool as impressive as these guys are it's quite clear that some people are born with grit and some people aren't because when they go through their training it's not as if these guys can't do the push-ups or can't run or can't withstand the rain or can't be underwater for a certain amount of time they're all basically at a physical or sort of endurance strength level that would allow them to do those challenges in the first place right most probably like for instance if you enter a crossfit competition it's most likely that you're obviously at a level that needed to be to kind of get into it. So when you go to a buds training, whatever me or, or you know whatever the training is when you before you go into the army or before you go into the navy, you would assume that you're of a level that would allow you to compete with those people. So the the ones that ring the bell, I don't think are oh, ringing the bell because they're not fit enough. They're ringing the bell because something in their head just says, "No, nah, this is enough. Go home." So I've always wondered what is what why does some why do some people have that switch and some people don't. Some people just don't have a switch. They just continue going. They'll continue going until they literally their legs will fall off their body, or until somebody you know actually tells them to stop and physically get pulls them away from whatever place they are. And um, but I think with COVID, oddly enough, it's kind of conditioned us, or it's kind of made us develop grit, even if we didn't have it. Because I feel like a lot of people, from what I've seen and read online, it feels like people are freaking out a lot less than they were last year about this impending doom is going to happen post Christmas, especially in the UK, because from what we've been hearing so far in the UK, um, they're going to probably announce some sort of lockdown, some sort of circuit breaker, some sort of restrictions are going to be put into place just after Christmas. So maybe between like the 27th and the 28th are usually the dates they're kind of, you know, putting out there, which obviously means for the most part, New Year's Eve and New Year's Day is going to be cancelled, which is, you know, no surprise really considering how rampant this variant is basically affecting everybody in a way everyone's panicking. It makes complete sense that they're going to obviously do that because it seems like the only option they always pull for whenever numbers get too high, whenever they're worried about the cases, and worried about overloading the NHS even though there's doctors and nurses doing fucking TikTok videos and shit all over the place right um the first thing they pull for is restrictions the first thing they pull for is don't go out there don't do this it's just like come on dudes like oh come on guys come on people like we've got all these different you know we've got all these different medical procedures or processes that we kind of go through in order to make sure people have a better chance of surviving when they do catch COVID, especially if you're vaccinated. For the most part, people that are dying, it doesn't feel like other ones that aren't vaccin are, are vaccinated. It feels like the ones that are dying are the ones that aren't vaccinated, which is you know, a whole different story. I don't want to get into it. I don't care. But we've developed all these alternative methods to ensure people, you know, 
hang around as long as they can even if they get the virus of course there's some long covid symptoms that we don't like the loss of taste the loss of smell isn't fun i don't think so i think some people have had even lung issues respiratory issues that they're still suffering from um off the back of catching covid so it's not really something that you should get and just think oh it's just a flu that's obviously dumb um especially if you're going to end up passing on to people and i'm an un untold amount of people it just doesn't make any sense but <clears throat> surely there has to be another option like another way to deal with it we have other ways to deal with COVID that's not just a vaccine, especially if you've been vaccinated because they can't just keep injecting you after you've got it. They have to look for other ways to kind of mend you. So if that's the case, why don't we have other ways to kind of stem the cases or to basically learn to live with it? I don't know, do something different than just the same old nonsense. But again, like I was saying in the beginning, I think the only good thing to come out of this is the fact that us in Western Europe, we become a lot more, I think we become a lot more mentally resilient we become a lot more tougher and we've kind of been a lot more i say unwavering not unwavering but we've cut we i feel like the people who are really down for lockdowns and vaccines are one way the people that just don't give a shit and just continue living their life are one way and it doesn't feel like there's much kind of overlap between the two groups and at the moment again i'm only speaking for the uk i know it's crazy in the us many parts of europe but for the most part in the uk you don't get many people shouting at each other anymore about getting this getting a booster it's like people just leave each other alone it's annoying don't get me wrong when you see the numbers you're like oh i'm vaccinated people are making us sick again or they're making us lose our freedoms cool whatever the narrative is annoying but i don't really see as much infighting as it was before it looks like most people are kind of pointing their their eye or their kind of disdain towards the government which has obviously been easy nowadays because of all these flipping leaks about the parties going on in number 10 they've made it really easy for them to, for there to be like a boogeyman you can kind of point your anger towards but it's been good to see the public not kind of um revert, revert to form and just go back to you know pointing fingers at people or oh, you didn't get a booster you didn't get double jabbed you're the one that's making my grandma die all these fucking base level nonsense arguments when at the heart of it the point is we're like two and a half years into this nonsense it feels like every winter we're going to get a different variant of this virus especially if it keeps mutating especially on top of a flu so why don't we put asking our governments questions as to why or how we can kind of be, come out of this and go to the next phase like why aren't there questions where people are generally asking each other hey is there a date where i don't have to wear this mask anymore what's the date what's the date we're aiming for where i don't have to keep having a flipping hand sanitizer in my pocket i don't know there should be something we're kind of saying in that regard that kind of gets us thinking about when the end's going to come because it feels like this is a never-ending trip it, like i said it feels like groundhog day we just keep waking up in the same sort of fever dream again and again and again and they keep doing the same thing again and again and again and it's just like come on man let's get over this but you know if if we get out of this and we're just more resilient as a nation we're more resilient as people i think that's a good thing like i said life is mostly suffering so if you can withstand all these kind of you know um crazy things that happen to you especially things that you didn't cause that just kind of coming along your way as you're just trying to live your life and you're able to withstand it you're able to kind of succeed you're able to see your family go out have dinner you know buy things visit places all these things that you're able to do in spite of all this nonsense going on and all the volcanoes erupting all over the place and cases blowing up i think that says a lot about you and it will definitely will put you in a far better place when things eventually get back to normal eventually that's the hope then of course um on the weekend i ended up going to fold of course i ended up going to the telly house london 24-hour party as you can see here on the screen at fold my favorite club in london basically the best club in the uk i think hands down um and it was hella fun hella hella fun i feel kind of ridiculous saying hella but hey it is what it is um that day i think i was working quite late up until maybe midnight so i only had to time to go between like basically 12 and 6 before i had to come back home and work in the morning and stuff so it was a bit of a mad dash to kind of get back but all in all considering how close it is to where i live considering you know in general how easy it is to kind of get to it because it's basically a straight road if anything if you i basically i remember the first time i actually went um for the first party i actually walked from my house all the way there and it took me about half an hour or something so which was crazy so i was like wow man imagine being able to walk to a nightclub in london like you don't really especially with the place that i live in it's not the most trendiest or coolest area in london so to be able to walk to such a great club is something that i don't take for granted so that was great able to go over there jumped in an uber took me less than half an hour maybe 
maybe 15 minutes so tops to get there um ended up getting it just before one because the ticket i got was before one o'clock entry i think it was about 10 p.m and 1 p.m um the party itself was like a 24-hour party which is annoying because i think over time maybe the council kind of stuck their noses in or people started complaining but originally when the club did open it did open under the guise it'll be the first london 24-hour party like night club right and the idea was that every weekend or maybe two weekends in a month they'd always have a 24-hour party but then over time you know how these people are with the council in it when it comes to noise complaints and all this sort of stuff they get really twitchy in the moment one person makes a flipping complaint look at that place in manchester there's a club in manchester that's basically facing no eviction but they might essentially lose their late license because one neighbor is basically aggrieved that the, this this place basically exists they move into the area late and one person is basically kicked up a fuss and made it their mission to close the club down despite many different points of consultations and you know reassurances that they're going to do what they can to make sure it doesn't affect them day to day but they're just not letting it go and again the council for whatever reason doesn't matter if it's manchester or london they seem to react really nervously and quickly to these kind of, I guess because they I don't even know if they're paying more money in terms of council tax for these private landlords or private tenants I don't know but regardless it's always annoying so I guess maybe that might have affected the 24 hour party license maybe it was to do with that kind of pass that they had when it came to the funding of the place I remember some people got arrested about something ages ago maybe that was part of it I don't know something happened where it's not really there's not as many 24 hour parties as they were in the beginning but still that aside the fact that they're still again this is a thing i think the unique thing about london is that even though we don't have the greatest clubbing scene in the world especially when it comes to i would say yeah it's especially when it comes to the vibe and maybe the kind of duration and whatnot because it's annoying sometimes you go to a club out imagine normally i think the fold closes at 6 a.m so if i would have left my house at one i would have only been there for five hours maybe all right or maybe six hours if i'd be able to leave at 12 that's not enough time right you go to places in Berlin you go to a normal flipping cocktail bar and you can be in there until 8 a.m in the morning and obviously that allows you to kind of space out your night a bit be a little bit more well behaved not goes not peak too early um and just kind of enjoy the night in it, and kind of feel the vibe and decide to go when you need to go and obviously when you leave you're not all kind of coming out at the same time you kind of maybe someone might leave at four so i'm gonna leave at five I'm at six da, 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 da. but the good thing i think because we don't have many options we don't take these places for granted so even though they don't have as many 24-hour parties anymore and even though we don't have as many 24-hour locations in general when it do come around people really take them people really savor the moment and that's what i felt when i was in there i felt a lot of people were savoring the moment i felt a lot of people that were really in tune of what was going on um obviously it helps that they have this policy where you're not allowed to take pictures and shit in there they have a guy coming around or security guard whoever it is with stickers that you can kind of apply on your phone yourself which you know isn't necessarily the best way to go about things because i think some people are cheeky and didn't put stickers on their phone i think probably the method that they do in berlin where they take your phone and they put the sticker on it themselves it's probably a bit more of a forceful way to kind of you know make sure people are reminded hey this is a safe space coming here to dance coming here to lose yourself but no pictures like enjoy yourself like take you know distract yourself on the phone for one minute please and if anything the only people that i did notice on their phone were people like myself who was on their own um and then other you know that was it really i think groups of people i saw a lot of like how i've been there with my other groups of friends when i've been there for other nights I saw a lot of groups of people really enjoy themselves less people on their phones less people taking selfies and you know as wanky as all that stuff is when it comes to clubs in berlin it, it, it there is a reason why that works especially nowadays man it just works really well like no one can deny that when you go to a place it's like similar when i went to inferno when you go to a place where you're surrounded by people who are just like you it feels like a safe space and you can kind of be a lot more comfortable no when you yeah when, you, when you're in a space where you're surrounded by people that look like you or a place where there's clearly been a door picker who's been selecting people and making sure that they fit the vibe of the room it definitely helps with your enjoyment of the night and when you go to a place where they you know purposely tell you hey you are not allowed to take pictures in this nightclub it definitely allows you to be a lot more in the moment in the zone and not just concerned about document everything because for sure that adds a different element like there's no denying whenever you see a clip of those guys like i don't know tale of us and whatnot those really big kind of djs playing at events you just see fucking screens in front of them right recording you can't help but notice that the first time you're not noticing these amazing high level djs who get paid thousands of pounds to play all around the world right and kind of analyzing their production or seeing how they mix or whatever the first thing you notice are the phone screens and i'm sure when you're there the first thing you notice is the phone screen it takes you some time to kind of get into the zone but it's still probably a little bit of a of a of a bad vibe check whatever right so that was obviously really really good i really enjoyed that element of it um 
the space itself from the outside i don't know why but it looks more sinister than it did because again i haven't been in a while i don't think this is the first time maybe i've been since covid basically so it's been maybe a year and a half or something where i've kind of have not been there but um it looks a lot more sinister than it did in the past i have to admit that one um what else i'd say about it it looks more sinister um yeah, it looks more sinister. I like how they kind of blocked out the gate. So it's black now, so you can't really see through the the, the kind of gate bars, whatever it may be. Um, there's a little tent you have to kind of get searched through. There's a little ticket office place that you get your ticket or you get stamped in or you, they scan your ticket. You walk up the stairs, of course. And now once you go in, they've got this great system because beforehand, I don't know why they did it that way. Go again, crazy way how they did it. So big up whoever decided to change it. But beforehand, when you went to get your, when you went to put your Coke in the cloakroom, which basically is effectively your lockers, they've got lockers all on the front of the, of the club. Um, where you basically buy a locker, I think for 10 pounds, I don't know how much it is on card, it's maybe more. And then they give you a locker and then obviously you can lock your bags and any locker that you want in and, in and around the club. But beforehand, when they used to do it, they used to do it at the bar, on the side of the bar. So you have to queue up at the side of the bar, which is a bit of a, I guess, health hazard or fire hazard in terms of people getting out. But now they've changed it. So as you come through the main doors, as you walk up the stairs, you go through the main doors, there's basically a table right there in a the little, where the cloak room, where the lockers are, basically in a little kind of foyer sort of area. And then somebody's there, you know, kind of get your locker, they write down your name, make, the, make sure the number's there, you give them the cash, and obviously you get it back once you to give back the locker. Um, and that was brilliant brilliant system you just find a locker that works the only problem is there's not many that will do work especially towards the front you have to maybe go maybe inside or maybe towards the back where the djs are playing a few of them are a little bit janky a few of them are a little bit broken but in terms of a easy system to kind of have your stuff in there and just be able to dance and have some fun it's great which then obviously invites a lot more club kids like i said it's probably the only place club wise i think again outside of all the club nights like the infernos the budokais the he the the, the he day no she, he she day and who else there's a few others right that exist that kind of have club kids that attend their raves but in terms of clubs where people go and actually dress up that's probably one of the only ones i've seen for the most part people actually make an effort to put on crazy outfits makeup shoes like just really looking amazing so that was quite cool to see and just generally man great vibe um um who did i see most people are, oh the one i went to see obviously that i was super excited for was fiac was fiac is that how you pronounce it fiac right fiac fiac right um th these two guys they obviously played it was fucking great to hear them um for i think from about 3 30 to about half five um three really great tempo i loved how they kind of didn't start as usual when you see them play like or when you've seen them on live streams they usually really start really hard i've always thought but I felt like they eased into it a lot more in the club setting. They didn't really start off super hard. They kind of eased into it little by little. And then as the night progresses and as it came closer to about five, they really started to flip and put the pedal to the metal and really just went super aggressive and just absolutely smashed it, man. I really, really enjoyed it. I was dancing my tits off at the front for a bit. Um, then went to the back. They just kind of perused around, took took everything in. Because again, it's the first time I've been there in a while. Able to say hi to a few people that I met beforehand bumped into a couple of the owners as well said hi from afar that was cool and just kind of soaked in the vibe and really really good i'm not going to lie again bartenders are really attentive and fast um toilets are easy to get to lockers are there it's a good little smoking area you can go out and basically unwind and sort of kind of take in the environment and stuff like just really really well done like it's an easy space to kind of navigate so basically it's square with djs at the front you know smoking area towards the left there's like a little i think green room sort of vip thing towards the back that you know that doesn't really matter because again the club the main club is where you should where the where the kind of the real vibes are at and all that malarkey but yeah i had a, I had a lot of fun i'm not going to lie i really, really did have a lot of fun but it also brought me into um yeah i had a lot of fun so i really do recommend you check it out if you do if you do if you can i'm not sure if they've got anything planned for new year's eve actually um, what did they have planned for New Year's Eve? I know they had Unfold. I think I missed that one. That was usually the night that they do with all their resident DJs. It's usually meant to be amazing. I think for all the time, again, maybe because I work too much, but for all the times I've been there, and again, I, I went there from the very first time it opened in August 2018. I still haven't been to an Unfold, you know. I think because the idea of me going to a Sunday rave in London just doesn't make any sense. Usually when I book a holiday and go away, sometimes that makes sense. But being in London and being able to Sunday rave is such a privilege. Like, I really envy people that can do that. <laughs> um... Oh yeah, so they have yeah, they have an art of dark party that's gonna be fucking banging. So if you can go to that on Monday twenty seventh, I recommend you do. Um, of course, acid thing coming on a Sunday. They have okay, they have a they have a, a New Year's Eve party planned on the new uh, on 
on the first with Blawan, Madam X, Otix and Tosiko Otter playing. I guess Blawan, does he live here or is he still in Berlin? I'm not too sure. So that might be, that might not be on. I'm not too sure if that's actually going to be on actually. I'm really, really going to be interested to see that. But there's a few parties that you can really choose from that if you're in the area to come and hang out at. I really recommend you check them out for sure. Definitely one of my favorite places to go to. And then that brings me on to another topic what I want to speak about when it comes to just enjoying yourself in terms of vibe wise, Hold on. in terms of vibe wise, right? And I think I need to speak about this more so because it kind of, I think, applies to the men the mostly when it comes to the lads when you go out. I do think there's generally a lack of emphasis put on being like a good vibe guy or being in kind of good company when you go out, especially if you're on your own or especially if you're in a group of boys. I think maybe it depends really because I think if you live in a small town, maybe your clubs aren't necessarily places where you go and discover new music or go and kind of connect or, you know, um, deep deep dive into a scene or meet new people, like kind of thing, right? It probably is just a place where you can go and get fucked up, drink cheap beer and drinks or liquor, whatnot, dance some music and maybe try and hook up with somebody. But I think if you do live in a pretty decent music city with a decent club scene, I think you do owe it to yourself to just be like a good vibe guy, right? And just kind of be comfortable in the space where you don't need to always kind of give out the aura or the signals or the kind of vibrations that you're looking to finger somebody on a dance floor or something. Do you know what I mean? I think it's quite important. It really is. Um, because I did see a few, I saw a mixture of things when I was out on fold. I saw a mixture of people clearly, you know, trying their best to get in people's pants, which again, terrible tactic if you're going to be sloshed. I never understood that. Um, I guess you need some Dutch courage, but I think the best way to really get yourself some attention from somebody is to maybe be somewhat coherent when you're speaking, right? That might really help. And then I also saw some people who just kind of, again, enjoying themselves and having a vibe and just kind of jumping around from crew to crew and just being a good hang. And I think I... um I've, it's, it's something I've kind of always done but basically I've, I've not done it because I'm trying to be a good guy but I've just done it because I don't know I just seem to enjoy the side of meeting random people having kind of meaningful conversations quote unquote right where you're high off your brains and you're just kind of sharing all these intimate details with somebody that you're never going to see again I enjoy that side of things and taking the opportunity to see okay can I get this person here can I do that can I? No, no 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 just enjoy that that scene and if, if anything usually what I've noticed if you're able to hang with one person, especially if it happens to be someone from the opposite sex or somebody you're, you're attracted, you would be attracted to normally, usually that ends up being a chance for you to expand your group because they notice, oh, this guy's cool, right? I feel safe enough to have them around my friends and my friends aren't going to be creeped, up, creeped out by him because he's clearly not trying to get in my pants. Um, and that always, I think, is the best way to go about things, especially when it comes to London stuff. I feel like the scene is just too small to be that kind of... Um, pussy hound kind of guy because i would imagine again i'm not in these girl groups but i would imagine names and reputations would kind of precede you and people will be talking like saying oh this guy's like this da, 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 da. so when i'm out maybe less so when i'm at home because i'm you know i let my fingers go when i'm getting on it when i'm at home and stuff but i think when i'm out and about i usually try and be very cognitive of the idea that i'm mostly going out to kind of enjoy the music take part in whatever collective ambiance that we have going on and just enjoy it do you know what I mean and I think that's something that I've kind of had to wrestle with for a long part of my sort of kind of clubbing life where for the most part I think in the beginning I usually most I use I think I used it mostly as an outlet to kind of escape from whatever hell that I was kind of going through internally right I went just to kind of tap out for six seven ten eight hours which is why for the most part especially early on in my life most people that would know me would know that I would stay out like for two days and no two nights in a row do you know I mean back to back going to an afters hanging out sleeping not even washing going straight out again just like on and on and on and um obviously that you can only you can only do that for a certain period of time but that was mostly because i went just to stay outside and want to go back home but then once you start to really get yourself engrossed in the scene and you start to take part you start to maybe put on nights you maybe do a bit of door picking one day you maybe just help out your friend in terms of you know bringing in some speakers i don't know whatever it may be where you just feel involved suddenly or you, or maybe you just come to the place a lot and people recognize you in the bounce that lets you in earlier in the queue or something or maybe one day you get uh, the, you get given the blessing to come in for free you're like oh my god i can't believe it right because most of the time that's that's not really something i ever look for but when it does happen you're like wow amazing or somebody gives you a guest list spoiler like, wow sick 
you don't really go there with that idea of like being that guy that's going to go around like chasing people around you know what I mean chasing skirts around it's not really a thing you know what I mean and it really should never be because I think like I said um, I'm always kind of cognitive of the idea or conscious of the idea too that some people no one's I don't think we're all coming there for the same reasons right some but I guess a lot of people are definitely coming in there to sort of kind of i wouldn't say escape but sort of lose themselves from what the reality is like and if reality for them is getting chased around places maybe for one time in the night they want to be maybe if you you know you can maybe look from afar but they just don't want to be approached by strangers you know what i mean they want to be maybe left alone they want to maybe just hang out with their friend whatever it may be people just want to have that sort of vibe and i think it's really important to be aware of it and just kind of enjoy yourself for the music side of things and i think there's more to come i think there's more to take out of clubbing more to take out of going to different places and doing the whole techno tourism thing um if you approach it from that way if you just approach techno tourism as an opportunity to go and you know get as many stamps in your pussy book and as possible from different random european countries and you're going to burn yourself out quickly you're going to have a bad reputation very quickly and you're just not going to enjoy it but i think if you actually go out and think hey i want to go to munich i want to figure out what all the cool labels are around here the cool record stores go vintage shopping maybe go to a cool bar dive bar maybe hang out at the skate park see the club later whatever do all that sort of stuff that's where you really get engrossed in things and you start to realize what the scene's about you start to maybe get a little bit more attuned to stuff and figure out who the people who the movers and shakers are in different places that's more as in my opinion i think that's way more fun than the idea of going out trying to hook up all the time it just doesn't feel it just feels a bit of a waste of time and again maybe it's of age i feel like but I, it was nice to see not a lot of that energy unfold it was it just felt like people were just dancing like having fun and again we don't get that a lot in london I mean, least, again if you don't live in london you're probably oh this is normal behavior but <laughs> i think in london for the most part you either get really dirty kind of gritty horrible disgusting nights right or you get really fun nights but there's no real in between it feels like but this was a real good in between where it was like maybe I've, there were some people doing whatever they're doing i didn't see because i was paying attention to the djs and dancing but it felt like most people were there for the party they were there to enjoy again it was a 24-hour rave you could have left that the next day on the 10 p.m it just felt like a nice time to be out and about especially considering the location easy transport links great security easy to deal with people in there when it comes to the, the, the cloakroom and the bar and stuff it just made it really easy so i think that's something to keep definitely in the front of your mind in it for some of you for some of you talking about keeping things in the front of your mind and talking about dirty and gritty things look at this the legendary club in shoreditch called cargo um which for most people i think most people that live in metropolitan areas in london or metropolitan areas cities sorry in the world have a version of cargo in their city the place that's basically open until 5 4 a.m um has various rooms playing various genres all at the same time all at flipping crazy levels of in terms of volume where you can just hear it all bleeding into every single room the acoustics are terrible um all the bartenders hate their jobs so they serve you terribly um they, they give you drinks in plastic cups that are warm and it's just like a horror show right every i think every metropolitan city in the world has a version of cargo but our version of cargo in Shoreditch is like a legendary institution because at the time it was one of the only places that you could go to, you know, and party basically with some type of music. I think most people, most of my friends that I kind of grew up with, I think everybody at least had one night or one DJing kind of opportunity at Short at Cargo. I'm sure they did. I'm sure they did. I'm sure they did. Everyone did one night. I know I did, right? <laughs> and it was an absolute horror show. I don't even think I even got paid for that one. It was just one of those kind of ones. You just have to kind of chalk off and say, hey, I got scammed. It is what it is and keep it moving. I think every promoter has one of those kind of things in their sort of uh, promoter book that they kind of been through. But um, over the years, it's gotten worse, mostly because of the bounces, mostly because of the, no, mostly because of the security, mostly because of the people that own it the programming and basically the people that go there right they just go there steaming out of their ears and their noses they're way too on it they're too they peaked way too early as i've done it many times beforehand so i'm not kind of talking at this from a point of you know um superiority or thinking i'm better than i've been there but going to a place like shoreditch and peaking too early especially considering the different groups of people that all kind of descend into that area of 
East Central London is just a recipe for disaster. You know, all that testosterone, all that female energy, everyone trying to impress each other, you know, act the tough guy. It's just it's just too much. People high, people drunk, various ages, various backgrounds, colour creeds, all forced into this one area. And it's just like it's a horror show. And I guess they had this weird entry policy for a time where at one point it was like, Oh, you couldn't let single guys in. They had to be with groups of girls, you couldn't get let groups of guys in. Then it was like you couldn't let groups of black guys in, you couldn't let groups of eastern european guys in a good like, italians in like they went through every kind of racial discrimination sort of entry policy they could go for and in the end it just went a bit of a free-for-all and anytime i went past it especially you know late at night you just see random people and then the other annoying things you'd see all these pushy sort of um street crew people handing out those packets of like flyers and magazines and nonsense right all this kind of stuff that you know is probably going to end up um in some turtle's belly somewhere right in the sea it's just absolute waste of kind of paper and time and they're forcing that down your hand you're like leave me alone security everywhere he's shouting at you to go on the other side of the road like this is a public road just it's a horror show absolute horror show so i'm generally surprised it's hand hand so i'm just surprised it's been it's kind of hanged on this long really am i don't know how it managed it i think maybe a good part had to do with maybe its owners they might be well known i don't really know but definitely mad and this is a good, funny picture because it shows professor green right one rapper here from the uk um pretty terrible artist to be for the most part but it's actually interesting because the scar they're showing as they're written here from underneath the picture he actually got this scar such in the face from being outside of chicago so it shows you and again i think at 2009 i guess maybe his star is maybe falling a little bit now again i don't really pay too much attention to the guy don't get me wrong but i would imagine 29 sorry i'd imagine 2009 when he got slashed he was probably quite famous then so to for someone his level of fame to get cut that way in the middle of Shoreditch lets you know just how bad that scene was. And again, imagine, look how close that is to his jugular, Jeremy, you know, on his neck. That that could have been a fatal stabbing. And he couldn't have been here anymore. So it's just it shows you how fucking wild that place is. Um it continues here, it says, um, this is headline courtesy of Hackney Gazette. It says Shoreditch nightclub where Professor Green was stabbed in his neck has lost its license to operate after bosses failed to crack down on violence and crime. At the request of police councillors sitting in Hackney's licensing subcommittee decided to take away Cargo's license on Tuesday, December 14th. It's funny that Cargo's license got taken away before places like you know the alibi and other places up further up in Dawson it just goes to show man like the licensing um rules and all that sort of stuff is just so backwards it does nothing makes sense they close down certain spots that take you know that kind of fair enough they maybe have some trouble in the beginning or maybe the middle of the time but they do make a concerted effort to maybe correct it and to put things into place so it doesn't happen again and then they get the whip cracked straight away and then they get license taken away or they get the they they get they don't get the opportunity to stay open for a long period of time just crazy shit that basically kills your business like especially if you're the alibi most people go there that was a basement club in london that i used to kind of do promotion that and dj at sometimes i used to go there all the time right it's a basement bar or like a dive bar most dive bars don't really get popping especially in that kind of area you know until about 11 p.m onwards so if you're limiting the hours that they can serve alcohol so you're limiting the hours of where they can stay open as a nightclub until 12 a.m it effectively kills them because no one's going to be there before 12 there people come usually between the hours of 11 and 3 or 4 a.m when it closes so when they did that sort of thing it basically killed that entire strip of clubs like we had the dance tunnel for a bit that was one of the better clubs in london too that died quickly that kind of you know grand opening grand closing and loads of others birthdays ended up having to go to loads of other places around that area that, again they had their spats of trouble here and there but they did make a concerted effort to try and correct it but then those places closed again way before cargo did even places like plastic people like again that wasn't to do with licensing now i think that was to do with um an investor coming in and buying that building and turning them into shops and shit because i think where plastic people used to be is where basically good hood is that kind of area um but still just think about it all those great places that we had in london clubs wise have closed before cargo has and cargo hasn't even closed it's just lost its license <laughs> i mean they're not even effectively closed for good it's like Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, officers have been regularly meeting with managers of the club in Rivington Street for nearly two years since February 2020. 
two-year chance since a rising crime both inside and directly outside the club. The incidents, which include thefts, minor assaults, large-scale disorder, and some on occasion some violence make up a disproportionately large number of amount of crime, disorder, public nuisance taking place in the local area. Historically, rapper First Degree, whose real name is Stephen Manderson, was slashed in the neck with a broken bottle in the club in 20... at the club, not in the club, sorry, at the club in 20, 2009. He nearly lost his life and was prompted to get a large chat. He was saying lucky over the 15 million, 15 million scar. More recently, levels of crime and disorder have continued despite the best bets efforts. More than 20 police officers have been stationed outside the venue on occasions while at closing time, especially as police order officers have been deployed from other parts of London to control clouds leaving. Just imagine how much of a vibe killer that is to be out on a night out in Shoreditch, right? One of our nicer areas in London, near Liverpool Street, near old street like all these little cool little places haggis no hoxton hoxton whatever those places are right um you're going to get some good munch you've got to go get a cocktail bar and then you want to kind of unwind and kind of dance the night away and go to cargo and then you as you walk up you see just bare lads like just massive amounts of kind of testosterone energy around you see get hey, girls screeching all over the place so you can't even spot where they are then as you're leaving you then see flipping fluorescent jackets and police everywhere um, what you call it, um, safety wardens, whatever the street wardens, whatever they're called. You see those guys on those station bits where they kind of have a little, a little kind of elevated platform where they sort of look at the street around you and stuff. It's just like, oof, CCTV everywhere, like Ubers beeping everywhere, trying to get through the traffic. It's just an absolute horror show of a place to be at. According to Scotland Yard, it says, no such resources have requ are required for other single venues in the area and the measures have come with significant cost of police force imagine right imagine the imagine the mindfuck you must go through from going from places like a jaguar shoes to a cargo and i don't get me wrong i, I wouldn't imagine jaguar shoes and cargo share many clients or share many patrons i don't i wouldn't imagine maybe apart from some girls i might like the, the i don't know i don't wouldn't imagine boys that go to cargo like going jaguar but just imagine the kind of mindfuck it must kind of give you when you go from cargo to when you go to jaguar shoes to cargo and you just see the people that are there the way it's organized you must be like oh my god this is horrible and they do a good job actually on that street that whole street they do a good job it's like as soon as the clubs close Oh, when they're open, it's like a horror show out there, right? Kebabs everywhere, people, niggas on the floor, madness. Then as soon as the clubs close, in about half an hour, this from the street cleaners to the people around outside the clubs, they sweep and make that place look spotless. So by the time you're coming back home from somewhere else at like three or four, it looks nothing like what it did previously. It's just pretty cool how they how they do that turnaround wise. Most of it's to do with the private tenants around. They don't want to piss them off. Last I heard, people like Mishka Barton and shit from the OC lived around the corner, so... I'm sure those people put the pressure on them to keep it clean. It continues to says in August, there were 20 thefts and eight violent incidences at the club. <laughs> in August, one month. Now, comparison, the venue with similar capacity at the same area saw so no reports of theft and just two incidents of violences. I saw a pattern which the Met said had begun repeatedly consistently. So that obviously shows that the club took no kind of no heed to the warnings. They didn't put anything in place. Maybe it was the bouncers, you know, letting troublemakers in. Maybe it was just the staff not caring, whatever. They didn't do any, put anything in place that would dissuade or kind of um, prevent those people from coming. And they still were allowed to keep out, kept kept being open. Again, you have to blame the council people a lot. And again, I wonder who owns it. Maybe it's somebody famous, but just think of all the great clubs we lost before Cargo lost, before Cargo eventually ended up having to come to a screeching halt. Inspector Andy Durant thanked residents from Hackney and Tower who supported the application to have license reviewed and attended the hearing. So basically, he's thanked all the snitches. Um, the management of Cargo Club did not address key concerns frequently raised by the met by the police. The committee decision as a result of those repeated failings. So yeah, they're done, man. They're absolutely done. Cargo is finito. And to be honest, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not going to shed a tear for them because it legitimately was one of the worst clubs in London. And it's really sad too because of the location. It's such a great location. Um, where it's actually is under the arches looks pretty cool, especially with all the graffiti that changes all the time. Um, again, location is great in terms of getting there and going home. Um, it should be a better club, but again, acoustics wise, terrible. Layout wise, terrible. 
um, the staff clearly hated their jobs. The drinks were garbage and really uh, over, you know, they overcharged you on the drinks, which, which makes sense for a lot of clubs there, but they didn't even take any care, attention in cocktails. It was just all garbage. Um, the music policy was dog shit. Like everything about it was terrible, really, really terrible. So, you know, it's not a surprise that places like that. Again, look at all these videos, man, of just hordes of people just stampeding. Well, you can't even see the, like, that's actually a road, you know. You can't even see the road. People just, that's usually, and again, that's not a good way of kind of looking after your club space and stuff. Most places, especially if they're in a busy area, this would always have somebody making sure traffic is kept moving, the road is clear, just to kind of appease the neighbours or to make sure your club doesn't look like an absolute zoo. But look at this, mad, isn't it? Absolute mad pictures on CCTV people are seeing. Um, is there comments here? No, there's not, but yeah. Is there comments? Yeah, there is not. No comments, okay. I wish people going to say some mad stuff on there. But yeah, cargo's going to close soon. Cargo is gonna close soon. Let me get a tissue before I continue here because hay fever is attacking me as per usual. Um, next on the list here, we have a story about something that I don't really, something I'm not really that familiar with in terms of the individuals involved, but I think it kind of speaks to a wider. Um, theme that I've kind of or wider ideology or wider kind of POV mantra whatever you may call it that I've always held and that's kind of been a little bit controversial when it comes to guys being involved in women's business especially when it comes to the sort of thing that I'm doing here at the moment cultural commentary cultural commentary sorry podcasting um, whatever it may be shooting the shit I just think there's Maybe because the gossip when it comes to kind of female biz, female led sort of stuff is a lot more juicier than stuff that you might see in culture. Maybe it's a lot more harder to kind of get involved in, in terms of researching the topics, having knowledge of the topics, being able to speak about it, you know, um, maybe off the cuff, whatever, maybe a bit more harder than speaking about topics that are concerning with, oh, if you go on a date with a girl, should you pay? All this sort of shit. Like, it's just the same old regurgitated bullshit. I understand how easy it is, but I also think that kind of stuff when it comes to dudes it has this ceiling and after a time when you just keep hearing dudes consistently talking about alpha this and girl that and doing this and being that it's just it just becomes a little bit nauseating and i feel like a guy that kind of spends their time worrying or kind of pontificating about how they sound or present themselves to women especially on the podcast with other dudes usually i feel like number one you probably don't get that many girls Number two, you're probably not the kind of dude other dudes should want to hang around with. And number three, you are the kind of guy that was, that's kind of, that likes being in women's business, right? You're the kind of guy that kind of fights with girls, argues with girls. Like, this really gross shit that you don't really, I would never kind of condone or never encourage or never say would be something that I would like from a male friend of mine, right? They're definitely not, I definitely don't have any friends like that. Don't get me wrong. I'm not the most um social guy in the world, especially compared to some of these people I'm speaking about. But for the friends that I have, I try not to hang around with people who like to get themselves involved in the middle of women's business or who like to just speak bad about women that they know in public. It just feels a little bit yucky and i think this is a great lesson to be learned for most dudes because what ends up happening when you do get involved in women's business you might be able to get you know you might be able to maybe win you know you might be able to maybe steal a march on her you might be able to get a few jabs off quickly right before she baby basically gets her flipping her um her kind of balance in place or basically figures out where she's at but the moment a lady figures out the, the kind of the the landscape of what's going on sizes up her opponent and then is ready to kind of unload you know verbal flipping venom on you you're definitely going to lose when it comes to that idea you're definitely going to lose when it comes to a back and forth with a woman on social media there's no way you're going to win that especially if you're a dude who kind of doesn't want to get involved in women's business because there's no le there's no level that she can't get low there's no level that she can't go to but then you have an ego so you don't want to get to that level you're just going to stand like, just ask oh, i'm going to fight you and immediately and most the as soon as you start talking about aggression and physicalities, you've obviously lost the argument. So it's obviously not a good idea to get involved in the first place. So this is a good example of why. <clears throat> this is a story courtesy of the Shade Borough. It features an influencer called Briley, um, claps back at a comedian called Kojo Anim for accusing her of being broke. Now again, I don't know any of these people, but from what I've seen, it feels like the girl won. 
Like she won very, very easily. And again, it was such an unnecessary beef from what it looks like because it feels like they were friends maybe beforehand. They maybe some had some sort of cordial relationship. Maybe they were hooking up before. I don't know. But they did seem that they were cool. So for it to go this left is really sad because, you know, like I said before in previous shows, you know, the older you get in life, especially if you become successful, it's really difficult to find real friends, right? It's really difficult to find people that you can legitimately spend time with and enjoy their company. So to come to this sort of place in life, this level of success and to finally find that people that you maybe thought were somebody you can maybe spend maybe 10 20 years of friendship with later on in the life are somebody that kind of you know have been plotting your downfall <laughs> in the background it must be somewhat weird to kind of reconcile with but anyway let's go through the slides and you can see what the argument was about and how i feel like the girl absolutely destroyed him and again it's kind of deserved again for putting yourself in women's business so stay out of that if you're a dude um this is a screenshot basically i've got on screen that features um Bradley basically putting a text over an image that shows I guess one of her friends sitting with this comedian guy called what's his name Kojo Anim and they're somewhere I guess in Dubai judging from the scenery and judging what she's talking about and she says the following is this you at Kojo I mean lying through your fake teeth of his <laughs> so number one she gets that this is the thing I've always said about women when it comes to attacking men Women have a really good way when it comes to verbally attacking men of just getting to... No, I think this is just advice for women. If you want to attack a dude and get to his heart and actually make him feel vulnerable and make him cry, just attack his insecurity that he's obviously trying to mask up, whether it's lifting weights, whether it's getting hair plugs, whether it's teeth, whether it's eyes, glasses, whatever. Just attack an insecurity that you know he clearly has that he tried to correct and you basically kill the dude. Like comment on the guy's fade and say it's a bit dusty or it's a bit wrong or the beard's not lined up properly or it's a bit patchy and you, you've got a guy thinking about that for months and months on until so the fact that she went straight for the teeth, I knew the fight was over before it started. It says here, you're embarrassing, bro. Calling a guy bro too if you're a girl. That's an extra little point there as well. It says, you're talking about broke. Your friend paid for everything. Absolute loser. you absolute loser, right? Um, again, she's talking to him in a very, in a very kind of mocking big sister sort of way, right? Um, let's, play, let's, play, let's play a game. This is a brutal bit. Let's play a game. Screenshot your bank account and I'll screenshot mine. You record your house and I'll record my penthouse, you absolute bellend. I love it. English insults are the best. Um, me and Nyasha was laughing at your poor friend being used by you to pay for everything. The friend, I'm not sure if that's poor, if he, get, if he just got like a, if he just got like a, a, you know, a bit of friendly fire there, or if that was basically her just describing, he was poor, I don't know. Um, I did not see your wallet the whole vacation, <laughs> acting like your friend is a sugar daddy. <laughs> saying a guy has a guy friend has a sugar daddy that's like that's horrible um i did not ask for anything you waste man uh mr e-man i think e-man yeah it's paid for my cab one time and i did not ask mr e-man is a real man who offers without exchange your comedy clubs could not get us on his level jesus christ i've got time today satan <laughs> this girl <laughs> I've got I've got receipts for every lie you told that podcast and sorry on that podcast and I'm truly disgusted that I ever considered you a friend. You hate successful black women and that's your problem. Trying to tarnish my name with lies. I'm in shock. If I tag the people you talked about in Dubai, you would be finished. I know I shouldn't stop. So I knew I shouldn't stoop this low. Um, I knew I shouldn't stoop to this low life level. But this man at Kojo, I mean, she keeps tagging him all the time. So basically saying, look, I'm, I'm putting your name on this, brother. You came for me and I'm going to come for your neck. Um, and it's the biggest fraud out here. Literally sat there and made up lies to get views. For what? Because I forgot to return the sunglasses you left on his on this very table. I was doing you a favor picking them up because Nyasha didn't care. What a way to create, what a way to treat someone that supported you. Jesus Christ. She's already slipping in little things about my friend doesn't even rate you. Like, oh, all these little, honestly, women, when it comes to verbal attack, it's just, they, they're, it's, it's very difficult. I think the only person that could uh, brutally attack a woman when it comes to verbal attacks would be maybe a fat dude because most fat dudes have had to sustain I've had to put up with years and years of abuse, right? From other guys, maybe other girls teasing them, family members. So usually I found most fat guys are either funny or they're really good at dissing. 
really really good they're really quick so maybe that's the only person i could imagine who might have the ability to maybe get a girl and really be able to attack her verbally but even then i still think a woman would be able to know how to kind of pick apart a fat dude too because every woman's gone through a philippine body conscious fat sort of face so they know exactly what to say to get at you so i don't know man i don't know i really don't the only one i've actually seen who's been able to do it really well when it comes to brutalizing a woman when it comes to verbal attacking them is cat williams there's a clip of Cat Williams on some radio show where I don't know what happens, but I think they're cool at the beginning. And then something happens where maybe Cat Williams maybe misconstrues something or she maybe miss. I don't know. Something happens where the energy switches as a comedian, as a kind of sassy dude being petty. He just doesn't let it go. And he just keeps going at her, going at her, going at her, just to a point where the other people in the room have to kind of get in and start laughing and making jokes to kind of mask the fact that he's absolutely destroying. That's the only time I've seen um a guy be able to kind of destroy a woman like in that kind of scenario and again this is i think she was a radio host too so she's obviously confident on the mic bombastic sort of personality obviously funny in her own right and then she was just like not able to kind of withstand it so i can only imagine what just a regular dude is gonna do when a girl like this goes as i was talking to you like this is like yeah 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 um but that what she said um the second bit she says here um um, literally sat there and made up the lies to get views for what because I forgot to do um, we fell out with Nyesha you fell out with Nyesha because you're both so alike stubborn and narcissistic oh she's obviously going after a friend too you both made my Dubai trip hell with your disgusting selfish behaviour y'all deserve each other oh so I guess this is Nyesha the girl okay cool so he's basically telling her the girl that you love or the girl that you're kind of trying to get with doesn't rate you and you'll probably be perfect for each other because you both stink personality wise it's like oof um, this must be the table I didn't want to go pay for another screenshot i went to my hotel room to get changed when i came back four hours later nyesha had paid for her table it's her table why would why wouldn't she pay for it this is why you gotta watch the company you keep because this is the most depressing holiday i've been on <sighs> there's something about again I'm, I'm sure this girl's an influence or something there's something about these kind of um hot instagram girls when they go on a holiday together what is it i've seen american girls go through it obviously uk girls what is it about girls when they go on a holiday together where Again, maybe I'm I'm being a little bit, um, what you call it, selective or this anecdotal because there's only people I follow, only people I see doing this sort of stuff. But I don't really see the same thing with, but but is there a lot of guy group influence? Is there a lot of guys? Is there like a hot guy in influencer scene? It must exist, right? And do they all go on holiday together? I don't know. Do they? I'm not too sure. I guess they would do, right? If you'd go and, I don't know, they'd go to flipping Dom the Dominican Republic and places like Brazil and stuff to just get, you know, to just smash as many birds as they can. But there's something about girls when it comes to these influencer groups where they go to these places on holiday and they just always eventually end up falling out or maybe discovering parts of their person, discovering parts of people, everyone's personality they didn't really like. I guess in general anyway, holidays with friends are always like that. You either kind of become closer or you discover bits about people that you didn't know that you didn't obviously like and then it becomes a time where you kind of be split and apart. Um, but yeah, it just seems to be a common theme. Another screenshot here shows a uh, conversation, SMS conversation between Kojo and I'm guessing this girl where um, they're going back and forth and he's saying, of course I asked you to leave them, why, so why didn't you just do that? Like I said, um, the queue was really long, my bad. If I knew who you were leaving, I would have had waited. The queue was long, Brittany. Come on, hon. Okay, that's him talking on the left. She say, brother, what do you want me to do? Question mark. I need my shade, he says. Then come back and pick them up, bro. You left them. I'm coming now. He says, okay, cool. Let me know when you're here downstairs. What's your room number for when I'm there? Over some crappy Ray-Ban. So he was obviously throwing a fit. Again, these are things that happen on holiday that you don't discover about people until you're on holiday with them. Like how kind of, you know, pedantic, how maybe uh, tight people are um the chaos that they have in general you don't really discover and again like i said it's either you learn to embrace it and love that part of their personality or it puts you off of them entirely or you just become that kind of person that says you know what i'm not going to go on a holiday with you but i'm still gonna be your friend that, that can kind of happen as well that can be a kind of reasonable way to kind of go about things another screenshot here oh yeah this screenshot of him talking on a podcast about the whole occasion right the guy mm. It was one day birthday so we just got we got oh, we just ordered down there everything on the menu so that everyone can eat a little bit of yeah man this girl come up there drinking, drinking. So he's already talking too, again, maybe because he's with boys, but he's already talking too enthusiastically about another girl. Like, you just don't... Okay, I've, maybe it's just me, but I've never been that kind of guy anyway, even when it comes to, you know, pillow talking and all that sort of stuff. Like, you just don't do that. You know what I mean? You share an intimate moment with somebody, you keep it yourself, it's a private thing, whatever. But you don't go and talk 
about it to all your friends they might know cool but you don't describe in exact detail what you got up to if anything in my life what i've kind of noticed in general the guys that usually are super descriptive about what they get up to with girls and stuff in kind of crazy detail are either guys that number one don't get many girls or number two guys who are wrestling with their own sexuality i've usually found it's a really crazy thing to say but i've usually found it's always been one of the two things either the guy is lying about the amount of girls that he sleeps with similar to like a j from the in-betweeners right like he's always talking about you know the female anatomy and stuff right you always know that okay this guy definitely hasn't been with many women if any or they're definitely people who are struggling super hard with their sexuality and they're not comfortable enough to come out to their friends or to explore in any way shape or form so they're kind of overcompensating by talking about people in you know crazy crazy detail that's not really even needed um, that's usually a big sign but all this kind of bombastic talk again is usually just liars as well because i've had a lot of them i know most boys have kind of gone through it i've said i've, I've t told a story here many times of one of my friends i grew up with when we were like 12 or something pretending he was hooking up with a girl in bed and it was a pillow i just what guys do some when it comes to girls guy can guys can lie like lie a lot so when i, I so i shouldn't be surprised when they're on a the podcast and you're maybe having a couple of drinks and you want to talk about your trip where you sort of feel like you want to unload and but it's just it's lame i'm not really down for it i think it's lame drinking eating food just going all of that and you know when the people bust it up yeah. <laughs> yeah. and, 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 and then and that. yeah oh, yeah <sighs> can we get and then obviously he's joking about that. And then a screenshot, it says here, I guess that's her typing over it. She says, to a dinner that I was invited to, to a dinner you was asking me to try this and meet. It's amazing. Oof. It sounds like to me, maybe my guy was trying to hook up with one of them or maybe he was wanting to hook up. Yeah, maybe it's one of those things. Maybe he was trying to shoot his shot with both at the same time. He got cold. He got, a, he got a, not a good response from one got maybe a mediocre response from the other and then he just did that thing that guys do where you just try and you know uh, both your butters in it and just kind of threw them both out of the flipping tub maybe in that regard i don't know but it just it's a bit mad isn't it that you'd go from throwing out those kind of mad innuendos and then suddenly you're on a podcast bad minding some or bad mouthing somebody um it says here to a dinner nyesha told me to go to and have fun just because i've i've uh i've fallen out with him doesn't mean you can't go have fun <laughs> rotted man these girls are actually nice like imagine two girls going on holiday together and one saying don't worry go out and dinner with him even though i don't like the guy you should go and this is how you thank them yo yo to a dinner that i had sat I had to sit too awkwardly while you was trying to impress american girls by donning uk girls oh, imagine the banter imagine the game imagine the lack of game from this type of dude to, to resort to hacky oh uk girls are like this good girls you get like ugh to a dinner you didn't even pay for. I've, I've got secondhand embarrassment for you, my bro. <laughs> Can we get some more? Yeah. And this girl, and I'm just, look at this girl just eating my money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Everybody, yeah. one pound. <laughs> Two pound. <laughs> Meanwhile, Buffoon and my bridging are sitting, uh, are sitting on the other side of the fucking pool, yeah? Yeah. Just watching the turn up. Just what? And they both got shades on. So you know that they're kind of looking at the door the gaps. Yeah. They're looking, but they're not really. You know yeah. what I mean? They're facing yeah. the other way, but they're yeah. looking at through. They're, they're looking at through the clock. This buffoon, check bro. this out, bro. Let me hear this one. This buffoon turns up. They get a table for themselves, but it's not paid for. The buffoon gets up, comes over to more. Hundred. So these girls. Okay, next one. It was one of their birthdays. So we just got my boy and. Says, oh, um, they're telling us that our table's gonna cost a thousand dirhams. <laughs> let that uh, marinate, no, let that marinate. Man. <laughs> Hear the cheek of the buffoon, fam. <laughs> the prize <laughs> that she is. <laughs> I'll, I'll repeat that. <laughs> they're telling us that it's gonna cost a thousand. Maybe they're telling us. They're Again, I don't know these people. I don't know this podcast or the name of the fence quarter, the rap party, right? From the sign there. I don't know the girl, I don't know the guys, but. From my experience, this sounds like a lot of bitterness. This sounds like a lot of anger. This sounds like a lot of um, rejection, basically being, um, and they're using it as a as a as a excuse to basically badmind these girls. I think or badmind them. In the, in my experience, it doesn't sound like this was actually a big problem. It sounds like the underlying issue was that maybe some of them maybe felt, I don't know, you know, and sometimes 
you go out with a girl or go out see type of people maybe you think there's it's one thing and you get there and it's another thing i don't know whatever something happened something changed the climate went different and then suddenly they then saw all these things all the things that they probably wouldn't have cared about beforehand they started to pick apart and whatnot um but anyway let's skip past all this stuff because this is boring listen to this guy talk about this sort of shit the the we're not paying for nothing because the part that's interesting yeah at some point i can't see my the part i thought was interesting was that after the fact when once all this was all done it was the way that okay let's 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 read one more of her screenshots because her her commentary on this has been quite good the girl it's just yeah um the last one yeah the last screenshot she says let's say what kojo was saying was true what man that actually has money in 2021 going on 2022 has a problem with taking care of a woman when they are in his presence go to nigeria or ghana this is light work bare minimum only broke 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 dusty men will sit up on a podcast and cry wolf while in the same breath promote sleeping with prostitutes <laughs> and will only go to date with a woman if she's having sex with him that's a good point not gonna lie um you are an embarrassment and i feel sorry for you and all the men who think like you you could not pull a single girl in dubai because <laughs> you just not that guy look guys call a girl calling you bro and saying you're not that guy and saying the girl that you're into wasn't even feeling you that what like and calling you dusty is just i don't know how you can come back from that men and which explains why you know the next video you see why he looks the way he does men with less than you have more game than you and again i like what she pointed that out because she's like look it's not even about money i'm not even talking about money or rollies or Bugattis or whatever or, or their miles whatever the people those people wear right in terms of flashy stuff in Dubai I'm just talking about being a good guy and good company and a good hang because I'd imagine a place like Dubai right where it's quite materialistic and guys are basically trying to impress skills with their material goods and all that nonsense if you come through with a modic with a minuscule amount of game and you don't even you have a fucking Casio on you could probably end up pulling quite a few girls out there if that's your kind of scene because it's just a good hang you don't mind buying some drinks you got cool things to do that aren't just the typical stuff. You're fun to hang out with. The, the, all the waiters like you. I don't know, those kind of vibes, right? That might just be a good kind of antidote to all the kind of really pompous, up their own ass, sort of like entitled dudes that kind of walk around those kind of areas. I kind of think that if they act a certain way, that's how they're going to get yours. I'd imagine. Who knows? Maybe it's not true, but who knows? Um, da, 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 you, have, you have an angry and dark spirit about you and you're not the guy I met a few years ago. Please see healing and restoration because you are bleeding over people who never hurt you. And in the next video, to make it to basically to end the point why I say you, men shouldn't get involved in women's business, the guy who's obviously out there accusing this girl of whatever and, you know, basically um, bad mouthing her name, then gets on his on Instagram and decides to make this video where he kind of looks like he's being, you know, um, th there's a gun basically off the side of the screen somewhere or something, or he's been put left in hostage, or he looks like he's been crying all day. His beard doesn't look as trim as it did in the other picture. He looks a bit more dour. He actually looks what have I think she mentioned his age. He's like forty. He actually looks more his age here than he did on the other podcast. So in the space of however many days or weeks, he's aged like a flipping you know, like a fucking avocado, which has been mad. And <laughs> he's got a completely different tone. This again, keep in mind if you're listening to the audio version of this only. This is still the same guy that was talking earlier about seeing this girl eating my money, right? This is the same girl talking with that kind of vim. Now hear how his voice sounds. Hilarious. What's going on, people? So, obviously, <laughs> there's been a lot said about my name this whole day um, on the blogs and um, a situation that I originally brought to light a couple of weeks ago. Man's um, voice went mad octaves in that one little five time. seconds clip um, already. I'm doing this video because I've taken time to kind of think Again. about my actions um, on the podcast and looking back at that moment and watching it back again. Um, there's a lot of things that I'm, I'm, I'm not proud of um, and I, I regret doing it. <clears throat> one of them being... Um, bringing something private um, to the public. Um, I was very, very, very angry at the situation that I spoke about. Um, what are you angry about? You know, something was happening with my friend, a close friend. What's going on? One more and then, we'll, and then we'll end it. So, obviously, there's been a lot said about my... Okay, okay. Then watch it happen kind of thing. 
and name Hallie. this whole day um, oh, on the allow blogs. It. And uh, allow it. Come on, just let me play this one video. Just please. sit there and watch it happen, yeah. kind of thing. And um, how it made me, how it left me feeling wasn't really, really good. So I reacted instead of um, responding. <laughs> Um, and I went on my podcast and um, I just put something that was private out there publicly and I maybe could have addressed it publicly but I was so livid that I, um, I, didn't, I didn't do that. Um, those that do know about me, those that do care about me. Anyway, no one cares. But anyway, the point is, if you're a dude, stay the fuck out of women's business. If you have a problem with another lady, be a man, pull her to one side, speak to her, especially at the time when it's happening because, you know, usually I found... If you want to get into an argument with a woman, try and bring up something that she did a minute or 10 seconds before. It's always going to end badly. Try and address it at the time, if you can, in a calm, reasonable way. If you cannot, do what most guys do and just suck it in and internalize the pain and take it out on somebody else. That's what most people do in their walk of life because they know it's not going to end well if they get into some sort of verbal spat with a female, even if it's your sister, if it's your mum, if it's your girlfriend, whatever. You know it's always going to end well. You're never going to come out of it looking well. And especially on social media, especially in these kind of scenarios where you're an influencer and you're a cultural commentator and stuff, you're going to end up looking like an absolute bellend, as the girl mentioned, or donut, or a wallad, or just a waste man in general, man. Like, again, I'm not, I've never been a fan of it. I think all those guys that talk about about women's business too much they've always got a common theme in them there's a very there's a lot of moistness a lot of kind of h2o a lot of drip a lot of like drippy not in a good way about them like look at the side mans look at this guy like, they're all the same they're all cuffing the same cloth um yeah it's it's not even worth even commentating to one even more any longer don't get involved in with women's business don't next on the list here <laughs> want to talk about an interesting development courtesy of RA. It looks like 11 Berlin clubs and promoters have started legal action against a dancing bank that's been instituted in Berlin, right? And um, I think the Berlin Senate tries to be a little bit clever when it comes to the dancing ban, right? So they put this dancing ban in place in a way to basically protect themselves from any kind of, I guess, legal action from the clubs or any kind of bad, I want to say bad, um, hmm, it was a bad response but it was an interesting approach that they tried to do where instead of closing the clubs they said hey you're gonna ban dancing but you're still allowed to open but just no dancing allowed so effectively what would happen all these clubs would be have to turn into what tabled clubs or something right to let basically or just basically stop people from dancing on a dance floor, which is flipping insane but that's what basically they went to do because they didn't want to ban the clubs because i guess if i'm not mistaken maybe during the first lockdowns when they actually banned clubs from cl opening there was another court case happening maybe another case lingering so maybe this was a way of maybe avoiding having extra cases kind of latched onto the side of that but i guess now things have obviously changed so this is courtesy of ra it says um uh, the, it, the the group includes clubs ost kick out club and the legendary dj paul van dyke in so <clears throat> In Berlin, clubs and promoters are taking legal action over the city's largest dancing ban. The 11 strong group, which includes Club Ost, Isomnia, Matrix, which is a terrible bar, but, you know, again, a, a kind of an integral part of the clubbing scene, I guess, here in Berlin. Um, A7, Kicker Club, Revolver Party, Soda, Buck Club. Um, I don't know how you pronounce that one. And trans legend Paul Van Dyke submitted the appeal to Berlin's administration court last Thursday, December 16th, with support from the lawyer Nico Harting. It's interesting, there's a lot of other clubs missing from this list. So I guess most of them may be got cold feet um didn't want to piss anybody off in the berlin senate because maybe they've got favorable deals and stuff and people maybe look the other way about certain things but still these are pretty heavyweight names in terms of uh putting together a case it says here as a quote out of the clubs into the private party said harting in a statement on his website the dance ban is unsuitable for infection control i definitely agree with that harting and a group want the ban to be lifted by december 30th at the latest the organizers have invested heavily in the pre preparation on new year's eve parties and sold thousands of tickets reads the statements oh if they can do it before december 30th oh my god um, there's a risk of, there's risk of failures in the millions the berlin club scene which is already badly shaken by covid fears about its future <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting because I never understood all this um, approach when it comes to clubbing in Berlin, dealing with COVID. Because if I'm not mistaken, part of one of, part of the conditions of opening the clubs up was for them to install um, 
no certain clubs to reopen at the time was like ventilation systems i remember reading they had some sort of state here ventilation systems that they put into place to allow the club to open most clubs were basically very stringent or very kind of purposeful in the idea that you had to have a vaccine passport or a lateral flow test but if anything i think most places basically said no 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 vaccine passport no entry apart from some warehouse events whatever it may be i know i know those are spiking cases earlier on but for the most part it feels like people in berlin have basically um kind of come to grips with the sort of internal wrestling that you have to do where you have to decide okay we're in this bad situation we're in now in the pandemic and if people literally and if uh, the only way we can keep these clubs open the only way we can allow ourselves to have some sort of um fun and obviously again a large part of that scene is an actual an absolute an actual industry where people have actual careers that are centered around nightlife so if they want to keep them the only way to do it in a safe way is to ensure everyone's vaccinated everyone's got a booster or everyone's vaccine passport right that's the only way you can do it it's another way to kind of get around it and they've agreed to it and that's fine um, and for the most part, everyone was okay with it. Look at Bergheim, right? Like people were queuing outside for seven, eight hours when they were short staffed and okay with it because, you know, that was the way you had to get in with the vaccine passport, all that stuff, scan in, da 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 da. People were okay with running through those hoops. So to come to a point where you're going to dan ban dancing or you're going to close the clubs as a way to deal with the infection control doesn't make sense. We're doing it here in the UK too, probably soon. I've just never understood it clubs and bars to restaurants you know most of these places have great ventilation systems mostly because of health and safety regulations or fire hazard things you have to put into place so the ventilation system is pretty decent um most times especially look at the information or the stats kind of given to you in terms of actual places where people catch covid they're usually not in clubs and restaurants and bars and stuff which is again an interesting um thing that people don't really like to look at too tough and i just think in general they usually it feels like just do the club closing thing as a sort of it's mostly just a symbol that's what they do like hey we're dealing with kind of dealing with covid we're treating it seriously here's how seriously we're treating it we're going to stop dancing we're going to ban the clubs that's kind of how they're doing it. it's more of a symbolic gesture as opposed to this is actually going to stem the flow of covid or it's going to diminish the cases or it's going to save people's lives it doesn't really do anything really most of those things it doesn't do anything for the most part um, this is the kind of unfair and sort of difficult thing you have to come to grips with maybe just maybe this is something we have to live with maybe just maybe the people that are passing away are just unlucky in that regard and maybe there's just other options out there that we maybe have to kind of try to explore the same options we keep exploring the same lockdowns the same limited restrictions and then again we're, you know governments and are having to basically print money that doesn't exist which is definitely going to hurt us later on down the road um they could they're instituting control and governmental oversight that we're probably never going to get back again or freedoms that we're never going to get back again it's just it just feels like hell for everybody and then not to kind of mention the children who are having to come in and out of school you know in school learning home learning learning with the mask on um social distancing in classes like all this crazy stuff that we don't know what the effects are going to be for the future generation people that have been put out of work people that are still looking for work like it's just a crazy situation you think that maybe they would weigh up all the pros and cons and decide you know what maybe this might be one part that we maybe leave open just because it provides people with some level of escapism from the daily horrors that they're going through i don't know it continues here it says Berlin's Club Commission isn't part of the group, but it has come out separately against the ban, proposing mandatory PCR tests as an alternative. We are carried out a pilot project with the hospital Cherry for this purpose. They were successful. Hmm. Interesting that the Berlin Club Commission that isn't taking part. I wonder if they're in the pocket of the Berlin government somewhat. That's a bit weird, isn't it? Why wouldn't they want to take part in this? weird it continues. It said the group also believes PCR testing is a viable solution. I definitely agree. The pilot project specifically prove that there are no significant risk of infection in clubs if testing is carried out consistently the only thing that's interesting about that is there's two things right number one people are saying that especially in the uk we're, we're finding it difficult to find lateral flow tests right because from what i did the other day i checked to try and order some kits home and i got given a sign that there was none available now the conspiracy theory that that exists is that maybe it's to do with the supply chain issues or maybe that they're purposely denying us to get lateral flow tests so we go back into another lockdown i don't know but if it's the case that they just haven't got them they haven't made enough again that goes to show that it isn't our fault as citizens that our governments and the people that we put into power put into place to kind of deal with these situations are just inept at their jobs this whole time no one kind of thought to maybe keep making more lateral flow tests to maybe think of ways to improve 
PCR testing or maybe to lower the price of it in some regard. None of that was thought of, especially coming into the cold, especially coming into the winter season, coming into flu season. They just sort of just let it kind of be and hoped for the best. It's just, and now we're basically being punished for it as citizens, right? We're the ones being punished for it. Like the people above, the people that we vote for to put into these positions of power, don't know what they're doing. And then we suffer the consequences. Classic. Um, it continues here so the latest dancing battle was introduced on December the 8th forcing most clubs to close some though have stayed open hosting seed concerts and even open air events earlier this year Berlin's administrative court overturned a dancing ban preventing vaccinated and COVID people from attending the event so it's going to be an interesting state of affairs um, it's definitely going to be something that's going to ruffle a lot of feathers I think it's an important conversation to have I think um, the 11 clubs individuals who are taking part in it big up you because I think enough is enough. I think people just had enough. The, the fatigue is definitely set in now. It just doesn't make sense. In the beginning, when everyone was scared and didn't know what was going on and was unaware what the situation was, cool. But now we have more data points. We have more experience, um, not more knowledge. Like, come on, let's go with another option. There's definitely some other option to kind of deal with. And also maybe just look at the data. If the data doesn't support closing of a whole industry because of, uh, you know, rising new cases, maybe don't close that whole industry because the effects of it are just far reaching, especially when people think of it, like, especially when it comes to clubs, I've seen from what I read online, again, I don't own a club or whatever, but from the stuff I've read from owners and stuff, it's one thing closing a club, but then reopening it takes maybe longer than closing it. Uh, it's just mad, right? In terms of getting the supply chain started, stock, staff, are they around? Do they still want to work? Like I think even one place, I think it was Blitz Club in Munich, right? The owner basically said, that's one thing he suffered. He's kind of not been able to recover from, right? And I guess imagine those kind of clubs, right? Those kind of bes not niche, bespoke kind of niche, you know, niche, you know what I mean, right? Those cool clubs. I'd imagine part of the reason why they're so cool is because the people that work there, they kind of basically you know they're part of the fabric of that place they make it what it is without the people it's like who would bother going there so when you lose those great people that made the club what it is and you can't replace them because people just generally don't want to work in clubs anymore they're kind of being put off or they're scared whatever it may be it's hard to basically wreck it's hard to basically justify staying open sometimes it's like we don't have we have half the attendees the stuff that i love that made the club what it is aren't here anymore like if it DJs depending on what location they're in maybe not aren't able to fly in to come and play like it's just a shit show of a situation so two week lockdown a month lockdown for some people it feels like no it's, it's okay da, 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 but the the lasting effects of it are just you know they're far 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 reaching and something that you probably don't recover from very quickly so it's good to see some people taking some action and deciding that nah, enough is enough so let's see where that goes in it I'm really interested to see how that kind of develops in the next couple of weeks as well, especially if they do it before December the 30th, because I've still got holiday booked for that. I'm taking a holiday off from work. If I can be able to still go, like, wow, that would be a result. That would be one of the biggest results I've ever had in my life, <laughs> legitimately be able to go there last minute they'll come on the first. But if I can't, no problem. I said before, I'm going to definitely record a DJ mix. I'm probably going to do maybe six hours or so. I'm going to record that and probably premiere it on my channel. So if you're around and you're in and you want to dance about, then definitely check that out. I'm going to put that up very, very soon. I have one coming, I think it's on the 24th or the 23rd of December too. I've got to kind of figure out what the date works best, but there'll be a little Christmas, pre-Christmas one happening as well. So definitely check that out if you're around. Definitely check that out if you're around. Next, of course, um, Maybe let's move on from that one because we've spoken about that a bit. Oh, let's talk about this though. Uh, this is courtesy of Mixed Mag. It said, the Netherlands extends lockdown and continues to ban on nightlife. So again, just our neighbours actually across the pond there kind of. It says here, the Netherlands has entered a strict lockdown for Christmas due to concern over the spread of the Omicron COVID variant. The, that means a partial three-week lockdown. Again, they put a time and date on it. But again, these things from what I've seen, they never opened before the end and they usually stay open after the, the kind of the end, quote unquote. So that's always kind of a bit of a misnomer when they say three week lockdown, because if the numbers aren't right, they're just going to continue. And usually it's very unusual that they kind of stop it, you know, in a two week mark, it doesn't happen. Um, that, that means a three week uh, lockdown that the country entered in November has been extended and nightclubs must remain closed. Non-essential shops, hairdressers, gyms, bars and other public venues are now closed. Crazy, isn't it? Like imagine just open, close, like these whole swaths of these industries just... Because I remember someone reading, what did I say? I think I saw on a forum, someone said, 
um, people don't think about hairdressers and people that work in beauty shops. I think I forgot what it is. Maybe it's in UK because I think furlough only applies to bars or I don't know. Some industries are not others, and I think some people are basically saying that people don't realize the knock-on effect closing clubs has on all these other industries that basically rely on it because you know people going to the gym, going to get their haircut, going to a nail salon or whatever it may be are usually going because you know again you want to look good, but maybe because they want to go out somewhere. So in these places to go out aren't open the need to go to those places to get yourself booed up isn't there anymore. And of course, those people are reliant on those clients coming in, right? And without that constant kind of wall-to-wall bookings and staying in until 8 p.m. sometimes, you know, you, you kind of find it hard to pay your rent. You're going to find it hard to pay your bills. So the knock-on effect is brutal for some people, man. It's absolutely brutal. It continues here, says, um, schools are also closed until January 9th fuck me while other lockdown measures will remain in place until January 14th so if anyone's thinking about going to fucking um what's it called um what's that place called man I've got that rave is called that they do over there deck mantle selectors and stuff I'd guess if you haven't already try and get some sort of refund guarantee on your hotel or on your flight or something because this doesn't look good mate the new restrictions come into place December 19th including the rule that only two guests will be allowed per household with four guests over the Christmas period um, according to the BBC Prime Minister Mark Rutter said that these measures were unavoidable Rutter broke the news in a conference on Saturday and said I stand here tonight in somber mood and a lot of people watching will feel that way too to, to sum it up in one sentence the Netherlands will go back to the lockdown from tomorrow so at least he's actually being somber about it and not kind of celebrating and using it as a point to say like you know I'm telling you off of being bad and shit because some you know leaders are doing that um, early in the day people rushed into shops to do their Christmas shopping with the reports that new measures will be introduced imagine working retail there during that time people living in Netherlands are used to uh, being urged to stay at home as events are not permitted other than funerals weekly markets selling groceries and professional sports matches with no spectators crazy in it absolutely nutty nutty state of affairs man i can't imagine how grim it must feel to be in those places right now it must be absolutely hell on earth i can't even imagine i can't even imagine um then we're gonna end it i feel like with what what's a good thing to end it with maybe we should end it with this yes yeah, end it with this maybe so this is courtesy of the joe biden podcast and it goes of course some of you guys will know i'm a huge fan of the podcast or i was a huge fan of the podcast i still think it will go down in the podcasting hall of fame if ever that was a thing maybe in the future um it provided me with many many hours of entertainment especially when i was working in some shitty jobs where i didn't really like where i was at to be able to put your headphones in and kind of be transported into a different world with people that you felt like were your friends you developed this weird parasocial relationship with them you kind of you laughed at all their little inside jokes their mannerisms all that cool stuff they had some really cool commentary when it comes to talking about music industry and culture and just you know stuff in general um it really was again one of my kind of go-to places to listen to a podcast especially considering the length right they usually did anywhere between two to three hours so it kind of covered loads of chunks of time two times per week with the addition of patreon stuff towards the end but you know as with all kind of great stuff it sometimes it comes to an end and unfortunately with this um podcast when it comes to dropping on podcast it was like um it was it was avoidable the end was definitely avoidable i feel like joe biden definitely got a bit too big for his breaches as i say here in the uk he started feeling himself a bit too much and for whatever reason um the question about accounting the question about auditing from his other two co-hosts in terms of rory and mal it did something to him it set him off some way and it went off in a way where it never kind of was able to come back from um again there's many more details involved in the story but overall that's basically what led to the kind of demise of the podcast the two other guys asked for the accounting they were kind of you know a little bit disillusioned with how the podcast was going maybe worried about the money maybe concerned about the deals that maybe got fumbled the fact that they weren't on spotify anymore i don't know something changed they asked questions and you'd imagine as a leader as somebody that's meant to be in charge as a boss because i think again joe kind of did a lot of performative things after the fact in terms of reminding everybody he was in charge my name is on the flipping you know on the cover this is my show i'm the main guy without me this thing all that sort of stuff cool let's say you are the main guy but if you are the main guy you should recognize why your show is successful your show isn't successful because of you it's successful because of the dynamic with all of them together 
Parks, Mal, Rory, Ian sometimes chiming in, Savon in the background, Scream, and all those guys contributed to it. And for whatever reason, he didn't think they were that. They he did he didn't basically value their contribution or didn't think they would they justify the level of questioning that they were asking whatever his point of view is i don't agree but i guess that's basically where he was coming from which basically what made him kind of get angry at them also for asking questions um but i still think there should be a part of you as a leader where you'd be like you know what let me alleviate my employees fears and basically try and provide as much information as i can to them so that they can know that i'm not trying to fleece them right i'm not trying to be a dickhead whatever just do something to kind of keep them on board because you feel as if they're you know they're important to the show that didn't happen they end up falling out a couple of strikes happen he replaces them with some other guys ice and Mo, sorry ice and ish who are doing a reasonably okay job but again i don't listen to the show anymore mostly out of i won't say principle but mostly out of kind of i would say um I, yeah i kind of feel like maybe as a fan i got lied to maybe that's why i don't listen to it because joe sold us this one idea that he was this kind of um he was this ambassador no, ambas he was the kind of guy that was fighting the fight for the creator right and he obviously because of his terrible reputation in the industry he was sort of like the underdog people that everyone sort of counted out and i guess we all kind of saw ourselves in him the fact that he was such a fuck up in some respects right we all kind of have versions of we probably have various levels of fuck up in us or maybe we have aspects of his personality that we kind of relate to or see us see us see in ourselves so maybe with myself i kind of saw it as a betrayal because it felt like you sold yourself as this one guy and in the moment it came to kind of holding your guys down or holding your, your your team down or doing everything that you basically speak out against that the industry does to people you did the exact same thing the industry does because what he did was exactly what spotify would have done to them what a big other production network would have done to them what a label whatever right that's what it felt like it felt like the, the, he turned into the man quote unquote or the industry or the culture for or whatever the the kind of boogeyman or the candy man is called when it comes to that scene and i just think since then i've just never kind of recovered from that kind of uh the betrayal and every time i hear his voice it just annoys me right i just kind of turn it off it just just pisses me off the entire thing so even though the show from what i've seen in clips with ice and Mo, sorry ice and ish is still good i guess it's listenable it's not what the it's nothing close to the magic that they had previously and i guess you could even say the same for the royal mall show the royal mall show is okay i listen to it here and there but again this the magic that they had with all three of them or four or five with a supporting cast you just can't replicate it with them kind of not 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 together that's why they were they were stronger when they were together but for every reason joe didn't agree with that cool but the main crux of it it feels like what's a spotify issue they were one if i'm not mistaken joe Rogan, joe Biden podcast was one of the first sort of like podcasts they signed up on spotify and if i'm not mistaken also the other part of it too i forgot which comedian it was maybe it was um i forgot her name but there was another comedian who they signed up at the same time so they had like a slew of podcasts they signed and i think the comedian podcast the female comedian she was kind of the marquee name that they had in all the articles on variety and stuff and the joe Biden podcast was something that he kind of mentioned after the fact so what made it sweeter for fans and for joe Biden like is that we were able to kind of collectively kind of you know tell all our friends you know share the show around they always obviously did some good marketing bits and pieces interviewed some cool guests had some very great viral moments out of that show but over a short period of time they were able to basically you know eclipse everybody that the spotify basically thought was going to be the number one and turn into be the number one listen show out of those shows that they signed so clearly there was a good relationship in the beginning right because they obviously were doing well those kind of platforms they'd want if they're doing well they want to reward you but i don't know what happened between then and the end but something changed they ended up kind of falling out joe but ended up doing what he always does and eviscerate spotify live on air you know they all said some very disparaging things about the streaming platform to be honest even rory and mal they also got involved because i guess they felt a bit aggrieved because again maybe they didn't have the information but whatever but spotify was a big part of the story of the joe Biden podcast and why it kind of went awry and kind of fell off the face of the earth and then of course in protest when they kind of weren't getting paid anymore from spotify they decided to obviously jump off the platform and take it the podcast exclusively onto um apple google play i think youtube and then patreon but it wasn't available on spotify for a long period of time which made sense again you're getting paid for it cool but it was a bit it's a standard he took like a moral ethical sort of stand right we're gonna do this because we feel like we're getting shitted on they're not treating us right cool but then suddenly they're now on spotify all of a sudden and mostly they're on there because 
of Joe's fuck ups, right? Joe got involved in that sexual assault kind of harassment case with um, Olivia Dope, an ex host of See the Thing Is podcast with Bridget and Mandy. Um, that obviously then le led to them losing the sponsorship they had with Square, because it's Square Cash, no, Cash App, sorry, right? It's Cash App. Um, and of course, that I guess was uh, being able to hold them down and pay a lot of people's salaries. Um, the Patreon money obviously can't cover everything. The YouTube money probably can't cover everything because not all their videos, I'm assuming, probably get monetized or not fully monetized. I know some of mine don't, and I don't talk as much, as, I don't talk about as many racist topics as they do. So obviously, the only natural thing that they had to do was obviously come back onto Spotify because they needed to be able to have a place where they can demonstrate that they have the numbers, listeners, um, you know, in order to kind of leverage that opportunity to get other deals in other places. And obviously if you don't if you're not available on Spotify, it kind of limits the amount of marketing advertising ability that you have for other things. So business wise it makes sense, but I think if you did all that rah 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 about being on Spotify and you basically found out your friends about it, jumping back on it again and then kind of using it as a chance to kind of giggle and laugh and make it seem like it was all a joke is a little bit disingenuous and again just shows how kind of detached I feel like the the people that do the show are from the actual fans that listen to it. They don't necessarily, I think they probably don't care, fair enough, but it just feels like they're completely different people than what we kind of started out listening to them being. And I guess it makes sense because I guess most content creators, when you follow them over a period of years, they start off being one thing like they're dusty they're just figuring it out and then as time progresses and they get more after they become more successful they become a little affluent maybe they start feeling themselves a bit more they let the success and the variety and deadline articles get to their head and then suddenly they turn into the person they always hated i don't know who knows but let's play a quick clip of joe budden and co explaining why they're back on spotify some of the people want me to explain why we uploaded to Spotify last podcast. Oh, did we? I didn't oh, even we know did. we did. I it. didn't even know that. We did. No, it's dope. Oh, all oh. right. Typical, isn't it, right? Typical Joe Budden podcast experience. None of the people that work on the show knew the show was back on Spotify. Even though they're all getting paid for it, even though they're all claiming a salary or collecting a salary, sorry, from the Joe Budden podcast. And it's their business to know, even though Joe will tell you it's not. They all didn't know it was on back on Spotify. <laughs> I guess in some respect, he'll say it doesn't bob. It's not their business because it doesn't affect their money. But just nothing changes in it, really. Nothing changes. Because <laughs> you're going to tell them? <laughs> because we wanted to. Because we did. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> we can do that. Imagine Parks jump chiming in like that. You know what's interesting, too? The Parks, the Parks sort of... Um, Again, I kept saying his name like Mal did. Uh, his decline or the reputational damage that he suffered off the back of that breakup is just something not a lot of people could have either write in it. You could never predict it. You understand if he suffered the reputational damage because he maybe fell out with Mal or fell out with Rory in the argument and they picked a side. But just because of his capping and his sucking off of Joe Budden and the fact that he clearly loves Joe more than anybody else in that team because obviously he's probably known him more in terms of their work they've done together in his music career. But the just the um, unapologetic capping that he did for Joe Budden, the getting on his knees and just sloshing him off it's just gross, isn't it, to see another man do this. It's like, especially considering Joe's track record of fucking people over. It's not as if Puck is not aware of it. He just chooses to accept it, basically, and not basically complain because I guess he's getting paid and I don't care, as you said famously, right? I don't care. I'm getting paid. What a tosser. Yeah. Welcome to independence. You can do what the fuck you want. Yeah, and I, you know, not used to that. They used to being told what they have to do. Right. It's a little different. I thought that was like the obvious answer, but I'm a dick. <laughs> And I'm trying to not be a dick. I'm trying to be less of a dick heading into 42. <laughs> Why? Well, I'm either trying to be less of a dick or I'm certainly trying to clear all the people away from me that thought I was too much of a dick. Reasonable. Listen. <laughs> no weirdness. <laughs> cool. I mean, logical. If I'm a dick, then go away. That's logical. Take that. Some, some of them did. Um, yeah, they did. That's a good, that's a good little, little jab at the end. Um... It's an interesting way to approach content generation isn't it? or to approach being a content creator and to approach your fan base in it. Like he purposely antagonizes them. Like he purposely keeps pushing their buttons, I guess in an effort to maybe clear the dance floor. I guess one, again, one fucking donut of a guy that I grew up with basically said that a lot about, oh, he goes into raves and when he's, 
doing a DJ set. He likes to clear the dance floor as a way to kind of gloat and kind of brag that he's has control of the night, right? This is my night. I'm playing the music. So in an effort to kind of dictate what the terms are on the dance floor and you don't tell me what to play, he would purposely play like stuff that people wouldn't like or stuff that only that he would like that's going to be divisive, maybe R&B, maybe jazz, whatever it is. And then that would clear the dance floor and then he can then start playing the stuff that he thinks people would like. It's like, why are you punishing people for coming out and having a good time? Same thing happens to Joe Budden when it comes to the podcast. It's like, we are fans. Some people, again, like myself, I wasn't, I didn't even like the guy before he did the podcast. I thought he was a bit of a prick. Then the podcast comes out and I think, oh, this guy's pretty decent, right? He wins me over his personality because I get to hear more of him. But then over time, you get to understand why people in the industry had whatever they had to say about the guy, why he was, you know, whatever, how he was perceived in the industry. And he seems like he continually just keeps poking the bear, like just keeps teasing them. And again, maybe most of it has to do with Rory and Mal more so, and less to do with the fans. Maybe there's still some unaddressed things they need to deal with, but I just don't get the antagonizing and the kind of probing and picking at the fans that way. It just seems odd, especially for people that were legitimately on the journey for you from the beginning. Like I was there from when it was, you know, I'll name this podcast later. Do you know what I mean? I was there from the very start all the way until obviously it's in, you know, it's recent end. And now it seems that everyone's kind of gone their separate ways and stuff, but it's just a bizarre way to treat content generation. I've never seen someone do it. And I remember even when the breakup happened, Joe was purposely antagonizing people going on Twitter and retweeting things and saying, yeah, I'm done. I don't care if you leave. Like just being a dick. Like it just, I didn't get it. It was just like, interesting. like wow, what an interesting way to approach content. Like, you've never seen that where somebody, where your fans are telling you you're being an arsehole and you're like, yeah, I am. And what? Like, are you going to stay or are you going to leave? Like it's like, huh, interesting. But I guess, you know, people stayed, but it hasn't really worked out in general because you know look what's happened they've lost deals they've lost sponsorship or maybe they don't have any sponsorship maybe they're not getting i don't really know they've had to jump back on spotify and make it seem like it's not an l when it clearly is um i guess you could argue oh we were always going to come back on there anyway we always kept the door open but the way they spoke about spotify the way they spoke about the people that work there the way they made it seem like it was a racial issue like you know they tried to slightly just simulate the story they tried to slightly just simulate it try slightly try to make it seem like you know they weren't getting the deal because they were black and it was a oh, come on man come on and then now you want to get back on there and make it seem like it's just a oh yeah because we're independent like absolute you know you know you know what i'm saying man you know what i'm saying um but yeah what else i think that might be it for now you know i think that might be it for now yeah i think that might be the podcast for now because i think i'm about two hours in and it's already late so thanks so much for tuning in as per usual it's been the next single single show episode number five three zero i think if you're first time checking out show via youtube you know what to do smash like hit subscribe leave a comment down below if you're listening for the podcast app of course leave me a five four three two one star review if you want to subscribe via patreon please do so patreon.com for just agostino and you'll see the show again very soon i'm going to record another one tomorrow another one another one another one, another one, another one again loads coming out this week obviously i'm going to bang out loads before christmas break because i don't want to obviously be recording all across christmas maybe i will because you know i'm addicted to this shit and it's fun to talk about crap like this all the time but if you enjoy the show and you liked what you heard then thank you i guess for listening that's much appreciated i'm nothing without you guys so thank you again for listening and i'll see you guys again very very soon take care and be safe